A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. Changing the character of downtown, how one family's investment in the cities could have a big impact in the years ahead. And hitting the ice, it's time for hockey in the cities. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but it is. A new hotel opened in downtown Moline. But it's more than that. It renovated one of the biggest pieces of real estate downtown, the eight-story Art Deco Fifth Avenue building. And it was done by a family that has had a lot of success in the six states where they operate. For 40 years, Mike and Kim Whalen have been in the hospitality business, first with the Iowa Machine Shed, then with a succession of restaurants like Johnny's Steakhouse, and now the new Axis Hotel. The Whalens are ready to bring a high-end Hilton Back Boutique Hotel to the heart of Moline. I sat down with Mike and Kim Whalen to talk about the restaurant and hotel business and why this investment could pay off big for them and the city. But we start with that first restaurant, the Machine Shed, that opened in Davenport back in 1978. In the beginning, it was just to make it work. And then when we figured out how to do it, I still remember the first time we made money, I saw her running in the front door waving the handwritten P&L, and I knew we'd made a little money. We made like <laughs> $3,000 for the month, and I calculated that at the interest rates at the time, if you remember 18, 19%, we could pay the loan back in 51 years and seven months. If <laughs> we kept making that much money. <laughs> but you know what? Not every restaurant makes money. Well, we, we turned a corner. It was a huge corner because with the first six months we were open, we lost money. So it was, it was a significant change for us. That was the winter of 78, 79, when it snowed every Friday. And every, as restaurateurs know, Friday snow is a lot worse than Monday snow. Was the key location, location, location when it comes to being at Northwest Boulevard, 980? Uh, no. <laughs> it was actually kind of out in the middle of nowhere at the time. Um, and that was before the internet. And so people kind of stumbled upon you and, and it was a lot of word of mouth. Uh, but our big breakthrough uh, was we got an article written by us in the Chicago Tribune. And then other papers started to, to write about this funky little restaurant named the Machine Shed. And then uh, the big breakthrough was the mobile travel guide, which was like the Michelin right. uh, thing at the time. And uh, we got in the mobile travel guide, which was uh, the big traveler's uh, thing at the time. And then you arc to this now, which is amazing. I mean, you went from a, a small restaurant along the interstate to a major renovation in the downtown of Moline. Well, it didn't happen overnight, so no. this has been a, a very <laughs> long road. So, um, yeah, we got into hotels uh, in the late 80s, right, 85? Yeah. And, but let's uh, be honest, when you started getting into hotels, if I remember correctly, and the words I always heard about Heart of America is that you buy the interchange and start building there, and that was kind of your theme. So this, something has changed. What, what made you change and, and, and get a little bit away from that? Well, one of the things that's changed is uh, the internet. People can find you. They don't need, you don't need to be right off the interchange anymore. Uh, in fact, when we did our hotel up in Madison area, we were two and a half miles off the interstate uh, because you don't have to be there anymore. People can find you wherever you are. You found the Axis Hotel, Fifth Avenue building. What, how did this happen? I mean, this thing, sat dormant for her so long. Well, it was actually an office building and it was, there was still tenants in it, but our, our office is just down the street and we walked by and, I mean, drove by this building for 20 years that we've been in our office building, but walked by one day and he said, this is a cool building, we gotta do something with it. So, that five years ago. I got a little uh, obsessed with it. Yeah, he, really? he got a little obsessed with it. It's to, I, I How, did, why? I mean, it, it, because it was cool. I mean, it, it, the Art Deco features, uh, it was a very unique building for its time. And uh, then next door uh, came up for sale. We bought that, which was the original Sears and Roebuck building. And uh, 
and hope that we could uh, somehow buy this building and save it, which here we are. At some point with an old building like this and a major downtown renovation, which you really hadn't done before, did you have a feeling you bit off more than you chew, could chew? Mm, this was a good first uh, historic building for us because we're right here. So there, there is a lot of things that come up in historic buildings that you can't comment on. And until you get into it, you don't know what you have really. Um, so, I mean, but we're right here. Our, we have five in-house architects, and so they were over here a lot. Um, you know, field measuring. It, it, when you get into a historic building, you you um, you learn that there's what you thought you had isn't necessarily there. <laughs> you did make some discoveries, though. Did you not find some original drawings or we some? Did. Oh, we did. Yeah. yeah. No, in fact, the the caretaker of the building you now still works for us. Uh, when we were first touring, it said, you know, over in the corner, there's a big box of rolled up papers and stuff. And we found the original plans, even with his original hand sketches, uh, which was a treasure trove. You never find the original building plans for a building like this. Uh, so we, that was a definite advantage that we had. But tell, you know, people may not understand this, is that when you're retrofitting, you want to have good bones, but everything else can be fixed. And you had how many windows? How much of an upgrade did you have to do? We had 500 plus windows in this building. And they're, they're big windows. <laughs> they all leaked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every one of them leaked. So it was kind of a race with time, really, to save the building because, you know, water destroys buildings. And uh, you really think, though, that if, if you had not gotten this building, like you said, five years ago and start the renovation, it may not have been saveable at some point. At some point, the facade would have started to fall off. There are some pieces that were just barely hanging on. And you know, st stuff stays on a building until it doesn't, <laughs> and then it falls down. <laughs> now, now I know you, why you are where you are. That's, <laughs> I did not know that. That's, tell me a little bit about what it's like to walk through this building now. Uh, it's a dream. I mean, it's amazing. It, it was not a pretty building. I and mean, we heard so many stories from people um, during our opening of, of they remembered their dad officing here and just, you know, it, so the stories of people that remember this building as an office building are really fun to hear. But, but let's be honest, it was an office. It's not like, oh, I remember shopping at Sears or Von no, Bauer or no, something no. like that. This was an office building. It was an office building, yeah. Actually, where we're sitting here, because uh, the building opened right after the great crash, the depression, and because they couldn't really rent this space because of the depression, it was a indoor miniature golf course <laughs> actually originally <laughs> yeah. the original use of of this space was that and you didn't think of bringing that back no we no, didn't think about we that didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it passed its time yeah somehow <laughs> so what is the future now we talked a little bit about the past you're now really getting involved in some interesting structures whether or not cedar rapids or the new downtown in 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 des moines or this as well it's it, the idea of uh, hotels and motels have really changed to make the traveling experience so much different. Well, when when we got into the business uh, originally at the time, what travelers looked for was consistency. And they wanted to know it was going to be a clean place, and they went to the the flags, the Holiday Inns, the Howard Johnsons, uh, those kind of things. Today, what the traveler wants is, is an experience. They want something that is local, uh, experiential, something that's unique. They can go back home and say, I really stayed in this cool hotel in Moline. Uh, it was kind of an art deco type of thing. So it, what travelers expect is really changed. It's experiential. It has, but it hasn't. I mean, doesn't that almost take you back a century? To, you know, to when you went to the grand hotels or mm -hmm. you went to the right. places that were special? Right. I mean, are, is, is, is the future the past right now in a way? In a way, in a way, um, it's good observation. Uh, I think, to, as it said, today I think the traveler is, is, well, certainly more discerning traveler is looking for something that is unique and not necessarily a cookie cutter prototype. What do you, what have you noticed? I mean, you, you get to a point in, in the Quad Cities where we seem to have a lot of hotels opening. I mean, you're always a little worried about saturation or oversaturation. Are we reaching that point? Uh, you guys would know better than anyone else. Uh, you, there's a lot of hotels opening, but they aren't experiential. Like, 
and so that is our our sweet spot out you know obviously not everybody can do the boutique brands that we do so for us at this stage of our careers i think that's what we find fun and you certainly hope that works <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll no, we'll no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah this, this isn't is, a charity event yeah. is it no no, no this is a, <laughs> there's been a lot of hotels uh, built everywhere i mean it's not peculiar yeah, to the market. quad cities every market has had an explosion in the last five six years tell me about downtown moline um, I mean, you invested in downtown Moline when few were doing it, um, and you've seen it come back, and it just seems to be, you know, once the bridge is gone um, and, and replaced, that uh, there are real positive things going on. You must be somewhat excited about this area, the downtown. Oh, I, I, we are, and, and it's not, opening a hotel like this definitely um, helps the, it, it, it activates a street like, like no other. Um, when you bring guests in, um, they want to be out and about, they spend money. I, I really feel it'll activate the street. Is that the way you feel as well? Is, is, we is, watched uh, an obscure rundown area east of the river in, in Des Moines called the East Village mm -hmm. go from a dumpy, frumpy area to the hot, cool, hip place to be literally in a decade. I believe the same thing is going to happen here in, in downtown Moline. We need some uh, people, more people living here. Uh, activate the streets, and then it gets a momentum of, of its own. It's a, kind of an organic growth. You seem to be investing in Illinois at a time when a lot of businesses are saying, <laughs> I don't want to be in this state. I mean, you moved, you could have stayed in Iowa. You moved your headquarters to Moline. Johnny's is basically based in Moline. It's done so well on the Illinois side. It, it's, it's now being franchised all over the place. Is there something about Illinois that you like? <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a good place. Maybe it's not... Um, it's, it's got its challenges, obviously, uh, in the public sphere, but uh, I think long term, uh, the Quad Cities is a good place to invest. Let me ask you a political question, because, of course, you ran for Congress. Yeah. There's now a congressional opening in, uh, in uh, eastern Iowa. H is that all in your past, or have you ever thought of running for office again? Boss girl would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you learn something from that campaign? Oh, a lot. You know, it was... Um, I learned that a lot of people passionately care about this country. We met some amazing people yeah. through the process and yeah. no regrets. It was, a, it was a great experience. That's what I was wondering because, I mean, you're a businessman and then you became a politician and that's, too, that's a blood sport in a different way, is it not? Well, I think the difference was is that I ran because I thought I could uh, help the country and I never served in the military. It was my way of maybe serving the country. and. Uh, the nice thing was is that when I lost on Tuesday, uh, we drove uh, out into the country on Wednesday, and Thursday I closed the office, and Friday I was back to work. I had a real life outside of politics. Did you, does it make you look at what's going on differently? I mean, do you, do you view politics, politician, or even governancing in a different way because you were so kind of active for that period of time? Yes, I, you know, I think that Probably the, the thing that I realized during the campaign and afterwards was that unfortunately substantive ideas are probably less important than the show business of politics. And maybe I was naive in that respect. The campaigning part, of course. Yeah, the campaigning part. I, I thought, and there are people that want substantive ideas, but mostly, uh, I think mostly it's, it's a lot of show business. And soft, soft uh, notions of what, where people stand. 41 years you're marking now of Heart of America. Um, what does the future bring? Well, we have what I call the sickness. We, uh, we have the entrepreneur. <laughs> we, we do stuff, people ask us all the time, you know, when's enough is enough, Mike, you know, you aren't too, why, why? And it's, we like creating stuff. I mean, this is cool. You know, uh, Unfortunately, work is also our hobby. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah. But I mean, you're talking about that you saw this building, you were delusional. Now you're saying you're crazy. There must be something to all that, right? Is, is this kind of a it's, sickness? It's worked. It's worked. I mean, <laughs> seriously, when we first looked at this building, I, I he saw nothing but beauty in it, and I just saw a lot of work. So, <laughs> a lot of dollar signs uh, too, uh, right? Yes, yes, and um, and and both of those things were true. It was a lot of work and a lot of money, and but. It, it's wonderful. I mean, it's just there's a lot of gratification in seeing this this come together and seeing it full 
um, in our VIP, it's like it's a dream. It's it's finally here. The other part that must be gratifying is that um, you can show other people how to be more successful. I mean, you're mentors to other business people. I'm sure you're mentors to all of your staff and the people that you employ. Is that kind of gratifying? And, and what would you oh, tell a young that, person? That's that's really so much of why we still do it too. I mean, the young people, the people that that are operating this property, I mean, they're amazing. It's just been fun to see how a team comes together and um, that's that's a lot of the, the gratification. As a businessman, I mean, that, is that the success story too? Is that you developed a, quite a team, a, a group of employees and? I just checked the original machine shed has about 350 years of tenure on the current staff. Uh, some people that are with us started as 15 year old dishwashers and now are brand leaders and executive positions. That's pretty cool that you can build that. And uh, uh, you get one of the best things about being a business owner is you get to pick the people you play with. Mike and Kim Whalen, the founders of the Heart of America Company, owners of restaurants and hotels, including the new Access Hotel in downtown Moline. And Mike Whalen says there could be more downtown investment, in fact. The company's next big project could be a housing development in the downtown area. Still ahead, the incoming storm. What's ahead for hockey in the Quad Cities? But first, we got through last weekend's big chill. What's in store for us in the days ahead? Laura Adams joins us with a look at the events on tap if you go out and about. This is Out and About for October 13th through 20th. Get spooky and watch the Moline Halloween Parade downtown on the 20th at 2. Or join the Family Pride 2.5K Walk Run at Niobe Zoo on the 19th. There's lots of creepy fun in the QCA, including the Witching Hour at the Hauberg Center on the 19th, Terror at Skellington Manor in Rock Island, Factory of Fear in Moline, Shock House at the QCCA Expo Center, the QC Haunted Forest at Prairie Lodge in Port Byron, and the Darker Side of Davenport Tours starting at the German American Heritage Center in Davenport. Fourth Wall Films present their newest film, Riding the Rails to Hero Street at the Bettendorf Public Library, October 17th. Christian Care holds a pancake breakfast fundraiser at Trinity Anglican Church on the 19th. Or catch these exhibits, Witness to the Revolution at the German American Heritage Center and Rube Goldberg, The World of Hilarious Invention at the Putnam Museum. Prepare to be entertained. There's the hilarious farce Noises Off at the Brunner Theater, October 17th through 20th, the Rocky Horror Show at the Circuit 20 speakeasy through the 27th, rated R, Billy Elliot, the musical at the Spotlight Theater through the 27th, explicit language, The Man with Bogart's Face, a radio play at the Black Box Theater through the 19th, Davenport Junior Theater's production of Beauty and the Beast through the 20th, and the Bucktown Review returns the 18th featuring Ease of the Bees. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Rebecca Kaysed and Alan Morrison are a ukulele duo who take an interesting twist on five decades of popular music. The duo joined us at the River Music Experience to perform one of their original works. Here's Kassad and Morrison with Every Day of the Year. Other 
Rebecca Cassad and Alan Morrison with every day of the year. It's time for the second season of the storm as the city's pro hockey team gets ready to hit the ice. The inaugural season brought out fans to the tax layer center and it brought thousands of dollars in giving to local charities. So why not? Let's just do it again. And joining us is the storm's general manager, Gwen Tombergs. Glad to have you here. Love being here. Tell me what that first year was like. I mean, there was there, uh, there's a learning curve. I know hockey's been here since 1995, but there's a big learning curve. We only had 130 days to open our doors. We started with no coach, no team, team, no players, no name, no logo. So last year was kind of a blur, and <laughs> uh, now and we actually you know feel like we have our legs underneath us now, and we're ready to go. So tell me, how is year two different than year one? Well, first of all, you know we brought back the entertainment, so some Something was going on every second. You did not need to know the game of hockey to really have a fun time. We also made it all about families, mm -hmm. family fun, and this year we're taking that up a notch. We have three games that kids can get in for a dollar with an adult ticket, and one of them is Radar's first birthday, and everybody so loves up. Radar, yeah. so yes. So the, the mascot being a big deal, of course. Very big deal. And, and like you said, I mean, when it comes to <laughs> hockey, what we did notice way back with the Mallards when, when hockey first was introduced is that they did market it as a family type of event, and you did see so many kids get involved. Very much so, and that's what we needed to bring back. We, we needed to bring back the entertainment, and so that's all of what we're all about, is making sure the coach is gonna take care of the product on the ice. Our guys are very, very good, and so now we just made, needed to bring everything else up so that if you didn't know hockey, you still had fun. So tell me about this team. Oh my gosh, the coach yeah. is, first of all, remember the coach didn't have any time to put a team together last year, so nobody had ever played together. This year, half of over half of our team is back from last year, so they already know how each other plays, and we won against Peoria Saturday night. So. I know, I know, very yes. impressive. Now, out of curiosity, are, that's who we hate, right? That is, that's, <laughs> it's the war on 74. Okay, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, the, always, the, the Rivermen are always going to be the arch nemesis. How big was that victory? Very big, because that's where the coach came from. So he was a player up until last year, and he was with the Rivermen. So he knows how that coach, say, how he thinks. And so this was really a big deal for our team to come out in the first game and win 4-2. to two. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty decisively, yes. as a matter of fact, yes. leading all the way as, uh, throughout all three uh, periods. But let's talk a little bit about the Quad Cities, because like we were saying, professional hockey getting here in 1995, and it proved to be a hockey community. Very much so. In fact, it's interesting. I actually uh, started working at the, the Quad City Sports Center. And because we got that, we got hockey here because it was the practice facility. So now that's mm -hmm. all changed because, you know, they keep the ice in, they cover the ice. But, you know, we need to be more than a hockey team. And that's why the Give Back program was so important because we'll always have fans who love hockey, but we need people who don't necessarily know hockey. And that's where that whole Give Back program and another reason to come to the game. And it's been great. Now, I know that uh, uh, towards the end of last year, you showed off that you had raised more than $163,000 for charities locally. That number is actually even increased because I believe it's now more than 170000 when you started adding up more of the change. We ended up getting a community service award for the entire league last Isn't year. Isn't that something? That was another thousand dollars and that took us over 170,000 back to our community. How important was that? I mean, did you have like a goal? Because it's hard to expect what's going to happen in a season. There's no, it was crazy because <laughs> what, what happened is that we were like, okay, we need another reason for people to come to the game. So let's give them back a check if they bring a group to the game help people fundraise. Everybody needs new fundraising ideas. Right. And so it started snowballing a little bit. And when I looked at the total right before December, it was about $50,000. And I thought, whoa, we hit 50,000. What's gonna happen next? But then we had the KISS game. Mm -hmm. And the KISS that game was, was $45,000 just back to the USO. So all of a sudden we're over $100,000 and I went, wait a minute, we can really make a difference here. And then it just kept growing and growing. So it was great. T tell me about the jerseys for this season. Oh my gosh, we had five specialty jerseys last year. This year we're going to have 12. So. It sounds like it's crazy a lot, but again, that goes into the funness, you know, because we have themes, we have everything from Nickelodeon to Marvel to Peanuts. Uh, our Peanuts game is next Saturday. We start right out of the gate trying to raise money for the Martin, Martin Luther King Center. And uh, so every time we have a jersey that's a specialty jersey, we'll auction that off and give that money to a charity in our community. And you also have nightly nonprofit nights. I mean, you have a lot of things that are going on to give back to the community. How important is that for, for, for sports organizations 
that are in a city? Well, again, you need to appeal to a lot of people. Exactly, but I mean also from the other point of view is that, I mean, you're act actively asking for groups to contact you. I mean, it's, it's like, oh. please let us help you. It is, it's very, well, think about every time you get asked to go to a fundraiser, you're going because you either support the organization or somebody asks you to go. So it's no different than coming to our game. So if we're raising money for cancer and you have people who like to support cancer fundraisers, you'd go and you would make sure that you spend money when you're there. And that's what this is all about. We just happen to give a lot of the money back. The other thing that you have going on, of course, is a lot of the events that go on at the games and it's kicking off with a little bit of a laser light show for the opening night. Very Home cool. opener. Yes, a laser light show. We actually have several of our local high school and college drum lines that are going to do a drum line competition. Think Vegas, just saying. <laughs> on the ice. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, it's just, we need to come out of the gate having something really the wow factor. And, and so the LED light show is it. I kind of like that you also have a bit of a nod to the old Mallards uh, with a name that people may not know, Toporowski. Yes. Uh, Jake, uh, his father was Kerry Toporowski, yes. who was a big deal with the Mallards. Jake is now a part of the team as well. He is our assistant coach, and Kerry has been a big supporter. Ever, you know, even when the, we had the change in the team last year, I reached out to him. He uh, guided me on some insights of, of how to connect. And so now that we have his son as a part of our team, it's it's great to have another local name to, so that you can follow. And you know, he's a great young man that we want to make sure that he stays with us for a while so it's fun and once again it's important to support people might forget that yes this is a sports team it's also a business it's a local business uh, two local owners how important is it to support this team it's very important because like I tell everybody just give us one game just come to one game and we will keep hockey here and we have so many themes this year and it's fun and it's kid oriented and so there's always something going on there's not a bad game in there <laughs> um, we even have one on St. Patrick's Day with two dollar beer so we're, we're going to have as much fun on holidays as the rest of them. So just, like I said, give us one game. And you're going to sell it. Thank you. Gwen Tomers, General Manager of the Storm from the Quad City Storm. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, WQPT also has a commitment to military families in the cities. We call it Embracing the Military. And this Wednesday, the Victim Advocacy Program on Arsenal Island wants to invite you to join the fight march against domestic violence. The march starts Wednesday morning at 11 at the PX, heads down Rodman Avenue to Building 110. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.